So um, the English uh, began their colonization of America in 1607 uh, with uh, the first permanent settlement shown here of Jamestown. Uh, it uh, was very ephemeral, uh, just built out of some of the logs uh, of the trees that were around it. It was basically built on swamp land that was not very uh, pleasant to live in and, and help provide a lot of disease. Uh, and the Jamestown settlers famously, they were looking for wealth uh, and, and not a permanent habitation and weren't all that interested in growing crops and planting, you know, survival. Uh, and so their supplies ran out pretty quickly. It's, it's a wonder that this colony here actually survived. Uh, and it, it largely survived because of the, the gratefulness or the, the, the giving and uh, gracefulness of the native peoples around them. Uh, and they, they got repaid for it by getting to European diseases and, and being slaughtered in some cases, uh, out, almost out of existence. By the way, the period of, of English colonization, of course, ends in 1776 with the American Revolution. Uh, so when you're doing your own research, if you're assigned one of the English colonies, uh, you'll need to you know, limit your discussion to 1776 or before that. So, of course, uh, just, you know, going back over your American history, which hopefully you learned in school, uh, there were 13, ultimately there were 13 colonies that were um, politically distinct from each other and also culturally distinct from each other. And it, it depended on who settled in those colonies. It depended on the reasons and the climate and so forth. The, the uh, southern colonies, the Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, largely were plantation cash crop colonies, uh, which they were growing indigo or rice or later cotton, tobacco, uh, and uh, they had a completely different um, culture and uh, ultimately architecture. Uh, the middle colonies tended to be small-scale farms and uh, seafaring uh, colonies, so um, and had the larger cities of the English colonies, Philadelphia and New York especially. And then you've got the New England colonies up in the green of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, that uh, again were also partly seafaring colonies, uh, small farms at best. They tended to be early coloni colonized by uh, the Puritans who were coming here for religious freedom. Uh, getting away from persecution of their beliefs. And so um, they had uh, also different resources available to them. And so the architecture in the New England colonies are going to be very different than the other colonies. So speaking, uh, we'll start up in New England with some examples. Um, the first being the Old Ship Meeting House. This is in the present day town of Hingham, Massachusetts. And this dates from 1681. And here is a view of it. So the first and foremost thing I want to point out is this is constructed out of wood. Uh, timber uh, was plentiful in New England, uh, unlike in the southwestern colonies of the Spanish uh, New Mexico, which there weren't many trees in the desert. There's plenty of trees in New England. And so uh, it's easy to cut down the trees uh, to clear the land. And then you can use that timber to carve and to uh, make into lumber to build your buildings. And so we see a long tradition of wood frame and heavy timber architecture, including this example at the Old Ship Meeting House. Uh, you'll notice too that it's, it's almost a Neo-Palladian building. It's just sort of a simple squared buildings with you know, a regular set of windows. There's a little entablature over the windows and at the entrance, uh, they kind of create a little temple front. Uh, like Palladio might have done, or like the Palladian inspired architects would have done. It's very simplified. Again, they're not, they don't have the resources and the, and the um, wherewithal to create really high style neo-Palladian architecture, but it is still, um, that's what they knew, that the builders who came over from England, uh, they were familiar with it, and they had their books and images of Palladian architecture, and so they were trying to mimic this to the best extent that they could. Here's a rendering of it that shows it pretty clearly. We see very tall pitched roofs in New England because, like we, if you look out your own window right here, uh, they get a lot of snow. And so with snow, uh, 
that you don't want a flatter roof because it'll just collapse the roof on that snow load and you get a lot of rain and you don't, you know, this helps to shed water much easier. So you tend to see very high pitched roofs in New England. Here's an interior view of it. Uh, this is what we call heavy timber construction. They take the big trees that they cut down, they, they you know, slice them off into big uh, square seconds, and they build this together. This was a building technique that goes all the way back to the medieval ages. Pretty straightforward construction. This is how they knew how to build. It was easy to cut these big timbers. You didn't have to slice them up into little, you know, little wood studs like we do nowadays, um, because again, they didn't have the resources to mill all of this lumber. Uh, so they could make these timbers easily and they could build it. And they knew how to do this because uh, a, a lot of the people that came over were familiar with shipbuilding. England had been a, a major shipbuilding uh, uh, culture and some of the people that came over here were used to that, they were experienced in that. And building a roof like this, we're looking at the, the half timbered roof of the building, is essentially taking the hull of a boat and turning it upside down and putting it as the roof and to keep the water from out from above rather than out from below like you would with a ship. And so um, this, this is the type of construction that they were used to building. And we see a, a really excellent example of this at the old ship meeting house. Here's a graphic showing this maybe a little more clearly, all that heavy timbering to frame up the roof uh, to keep, again, that heavy snow load uh, uh, from collapsing the roof. As far as houses in early New England colonies, we tend to see what we call salt box houses. And we see these uh, as early as the 1640s, uh, well through the 1750s before they kind of move on to a different kind of um, architecture. They tend to be very vernacular. Uh, here's a simple line drawing of a side elevation. They call them salt boxes because um, they resembled the people at the time, you know, had these wooden boxes with a sort of long hinged uh, uh, cabinet or whatever. You'd swing that up and inside would be salt or grain or other things and you could just scoop it out. Uh, and so the, they thought the form of the house looked a little bit like a salt box to them. Notice that there is a chimney. Uh, the chimneys tend to be centralized and their masonry, as you need, you can't build a chimney out of wood, uh, but the rest of the house generally is built out of wood. Here's a good example of the Nehemiah Royce House in Wallingford, Connecticut from 1672. This is a perfect example of a salt box. We see the long sloped roof down the back side. Uh, it's a wood frame construction with a central stone chimney here. Um, yes, Jermon. Uh, I didn't really quite hear you said that the, the, the long back slope of the roof was because of the snow. Mm -hmm. the snow uh, it's yeah, it's effective because of snow. You want a tall, steep pitched roof for that. Uh, and the reason we call them salt boxes, they would, they would tend to put this addition on in the back, right? Rather than just a, a symmetrical squared off with a simple, triangular pediment on the side, uh, you could have more space by extending the back side down. And you can even see you could, you could add on yet another addition off the very back if you wanted to. So sometimes they would add on in the back as the family grew or as they needed more space or had more resources to add on to their house. And like I say, this resembled to the, to the colonists, it resembled what they, you know, the boxes they used to store salt. So they called them salt box houses. So again, we see a central chimney here. This is really common because in New England, it gets cold in winter, and a central chimney would mean that that heat, the stone would heat up when you lit, light your fires, and that would radiate the entire house. If you put a chimney on one end or the other, half, your, half the heat would radiate to the outside, and you would, you would be less effective. I want to point out too that they even here at the entrance they put a little bit of architectural detail into the entryway. So again, this is an example of they they had limited resources and they would build just a simple frame house with clapboard siding, but they would put whatever resources they had into a more decorative front entryway to help impress and and kind of create an architectural statement at the entrance. 
Another good example of a salt box is the Adams House in Quincy, Massachusetts. These were um, the uh, ancestors to John Adams, the second president and, and one of the founding figures of our, of our revolution. This is from 1681. And here, you know, it's just a simple wood frame house. Look at the, the temple front entrance, though. Uh, to cre Again, they, th this is where they would put whatever resources they had, and they'd make a little fancier entryway. The, the chimney here is centralized. This one's out of brick, which is also easy to make um, in New England. There's plenty of clay. You can fire it, and you can easily make uh, bricks. Um, but again, the, the central chimney is the key thing to a salt box house. This is a slightly different. This is not quite a salt box house because you can see off the side, it doesn't, it doesn't extend off down the back. So this is just a more triangular side gable here. This is the Parson Capon house uh, from 1683. And it's a big house. I mean, this was a wealthy uh, individual or family. Uh, they could build your house, but it's still that simple wood frame architecture, steep pitched roof with wood shingles, but a central in this case, brick masonry chimney. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the second floor actually overhangs off the first floor. This was easy to do. You could you could cantilever the cantilever the beams of the second floor a little bit over, and that gave you a little more space, right? On the on the second floor, it gave you some extra architectural space. Um, this is the plan of on the left are the plans of the house you can see on the main floor uh it's real simple there's here's the masonry chimney uh with fireplaces on both sides to to warm up both the common hall and the parlor um, typically you might have a, a, a sort of fancy room that, that you would have guests in that would be your parlor and then the hall was just the common space where the family lived uh, this was your kitchen you would sit here and eat uh, you got the warmth from the fire um, and you only kind of held guests in your parlor and then there's you know two simple bedrooms upstairs also with their own fireplaces for warmth uh, and you know probably a, a primary um, primary uh, bedroom for the mom and dad, and then all the kids, and there might be a lot of them, they all shared a bedroom on the other side. Um, and then look at the details of the overhang. You can see that they put some little decorative brackets hanging down off the cantilever from the second floor here. So the, again, they, they didn't have a lot of architectural features here, but when they got the opportunity, they might put these little, little teardrop details over the overhang. Um, as things develop and you get more stability, you get more resources, you get better craftsmanship, you can build more permanently. So here's an example, Old North Church in Boston. This is from 1723. So this is well now into the colonial era. The, the colonies are stable. There's lots of people coming and living here now. And so you're able to build more permanent architecture. Uh, this whole church is built out of brick. Um, and with a with a wood uh, you know steeple uh, at the center, very much now looking at the kind of Palladian inspired architecture of this era from England and even the Christopher Wren inspiration. Um, uh, if we look at the simple, this isn't quite a Palladian window here over the entrance, but it has this fan light that is similar to the arced window uh, that we saw uh, in a Palladian window. Here's the detail of the church spire uh, with an image of Paul Revere. This is uh, a famous church historically because this is where they lit the lanterns, you know, um, one if by land, two if by sea from the old Longsworth fellow, uh, Longfellow uh, poem. And Paul Revere, you know, rode off with, set with others, you know, to warn the colonists in um, Concord and Lexington that the British were coming uh, so that this is a famous church historically, but architecturally, it's also quite significant. Uh, and I want you to look at the spire to this and then compare that to one of the spires of Sir Christopher Wren's churches uh, in London that we talked about, the, the multiple number of churches that we saw. So again, this is, you know, not quite, it's not a, a, an exact replication here, but we see the same kinds of details and inspiration uh, that Wren was doing in the 1670s gets carried over for several generations in the in the colonies here at Old North Church. 
Here's the interior, uh, again, a little fancier than the interiors of the old ship meeting house, which is, you know, uh, a century earlier or almost a century earlier. Uh, so the, the financial resources and the craftsmanship of the people living here now have caught up and they're able to do a much more refined, architecturally refined space. If we look at the middle colonies, uh, in, say, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the example we'll look at is Independence Hall, which was built to be the, the, the Pennsylvania Assembly. Uh, it later, because this is where the Declaration of Independence was written and signed in 1776, it became known as Independence Hall, but it was really built to be the assembly house for uh, the, the Pennsylvania colony, built in 1732, finished by 53 by architect Andrew Hamilton. So you've probably seen this, you know, in your history books or something, um, you know, very famous historical building. Uh, but this is pretty typical of um, middle colony architecture. Uh, clay was plentiful. Um, the cities of Philadelphia and New York had uh, plenty of craftsmen and resources to build more permanent buildings out of masonry. Not all buildings would be a lot of, you know, again, it was cheaper and easier to build out of wood. And so many of these cities were had a lot of wood frame buildings. Uh, but when you're building something really important and special like a church or a, or an assembly building, um, then you, you're more likely to build it out of uh, masonry. Very much a Palladian influence here. We have a central pavilion with loggias that go off to the side to sort of side wings, uh, very similar to the kinds of Palladian villas that we had talked about several lectures ago. Here is a graphic rendering of it showing the, how it looked historically. Here's a view from uh, back sides. Again, a tower that is very much inspired by the towers that Sir Christopher Wren had been building in the 17, 1670s and 80s uh, in his churches in London. And here we see the same kind of architecture in colonial Pennsylvania in the 1730s. Uh, and here we have a full on Palladian window. This is, you know, the classic Palladian window here. Here's a few interior views, uh, very Renaissance, neo, um, you know, neoclassical architecture, pilasters and entablatures and pediments over doors and windows that were typical. By this point, we're really talking about 18th century architecture that is popular. We talked about Robert Adam uh, when we talked about 18th century English architecture. He um, was very influential during this same era in the colonies that we see here. Here's a, this is the actual assembly hall uh, where the colonists met in 1776 to declare independence, uh, but this is where the assembly would have gathered as well. And notice behind the speaker's table here uh, is yet another pediment uh, to kind of create a, uh, an important background element for the speaker of the assembly. Yes, Jermaine. Um, Why did the United States lose like the, the Greeks? Like, cause all the courthouses and federal buildings, they all look like Roman buildings. Like, you know That's what I a mean? great question. I'm, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. That's, uh, we're going to talk about that in, uh, in a few couple weeks or so. Uh, early American, uh, you know, United States architecture. Uh, so hold on to that question. We'll, we'll get that answered a little later. If we move south, and I know we're running over time, but I want to finish this up. Um, and if you have to go, I understand, uh, no problem. You can catch this on the uh, recording. If we moved south um, into like the colony of Georgia, um, one of this, the, the plan of Savannah is a representative of the opportunity that colonists had if they wanted to take advantage of it. And that is you can build a brand new city, right? Um, the European cities have existed for centuries, even millennia, and you're just sort of building off of that. We saw Sir Christopher Wren struggle to, he wanted to create, uh, after the fire, the, the London fire of 1666, he wanted to create this, you know, sort of new city plan, but he couldn't because, you know, people just wanted to rebuild on the old plan. But when you have a blank slate of a new colony, you can actually create a whole new idea for urban planning of what a city 
might be like. And so James Oglethorpe in 1733 actually lays out the city of Savannah um, when he founds the colony of Georgia. And this is a drawing showing uh, the way the plan was originally laid out. The river or coastline, I think it's a river, uh, is down here at the bottom and there would be docks and wharves along here, but then a nice set of grid of streets with, uh, with major streets and even alleys, here's a novel concept, alleys that could serve, you know, um, you know, pick garbage pickup and deliveries uh, without clogging the central streets. Uh, this is one of the main problems of New York City. They have no alleys, and it's yeah, everything is done off the main streets, uh, and it it can it's, it makes it much more congested. But the other thing that Oglethorpe does in the Savannah is create a series of open squares at regular intervals. You can see them here. Uh, to create some public space um, rather than just have crowded cities that are um, nothing but, but buildings and people and they're all crowded in on each other. This was an opportunity to provide vent and ventilation and some green space parks that people could enjoy. Uh, this is the same plan shown in more of a figure ground study. You can see the um, the building blocks are in this sort of orange color, and then the green are the public squares uh, at that uh, Oglethorpe laid out. Here's another plan, a little comes a little bit later as the city develops, and you can see that as the city grows, it grows on the grid, and they keep adding at regular intervals more and more squares. And in reality, uh, these are these. This makes Savannah one of the most beautiful cities in America, because at regular points you come upon this wonderful plaza like this that you know has the old uh, uh, tree, you know, mature trees, um, and you know they put sculptures and so forth in the center. Uh, but it really helps provide some relief from urban density that was typical of cities at that time. So here's a couple of examples of the different squares and plazas uh, surrounded by, you know, architecture. This is post-colonial architecture here, but it's these grand homes that sit on some of these squares and plazas make Savannah one of the, you know, a very popular tourist destination because um, it still looks like this throughout the old part of the city. And you may be familiar if you far, if you saw Forrest Gump. Uh, the, he sits on, you know, on a park bench in on one of these plazas, and he and he, you know, talks to to people uh, waiting for the bus and tells them his life story. So this takes place uh, in Savannah. Of course, the, the rest of the movie takes place elsewhere, but you know, when he's sitting on the park bench, you know, talking about his box of chocolates uh, to the lady there, uh, it's in Savannah. Uh, in the southern colonies, the economy was built on plantations, on cash crops of tobacco and, and cotton and rice and indigo. Uh, and that took an you know, extensive amount of labor, uh, which was uh, forced servitude by Africans who were brought in. Um, but the architecture, uh, many people you know, think is really quite lovely and beautiful. You know, if you ignore the fact that it was built on the backs of Africans. Um, one of the best examples is Drayton Hall. This is just outside of Charleston, South Carolina from um, 1740s. And here is a view of that. Uh, and hopefully you can see this is very Neo-Palladian as well. Um, it's, it's not quite as refined as Palladio's Villa Rotunda, but we see a temple front portico on essentially a box with uh, very simple uh, windows and uh, nice entablature. And if we compare that to the Neo-Palladian uh, architecture of Robert Adam, his Paxton house that we talked about uh, a couple of lectures ago, um, very similar architectural expression here. This is on the back side, doesn't have the portico, but we see um, just like at Chiswick House, we see the staircase leading to a pedimented entryway. We see some of the pediments over the door or over the windows on the second floor here. Um, the plantations tended to be wealthier. They had a lot more resources, and so they could sometimes build much grander buildings um, than, uh, than we saw in, you know, colonial New England with the salt box houses. This is the interior. Uh, but this is famous because it's really intact. and um, 
quite exquisite. Here's some of the architectural details that they were able to build. A lot of times they were able to ship this in from England, um, some of these carved elements, uh, if they weren't able to build it themselves. There's another view of one of the parlors at Drayton Hall. And again, um, you know, all of this was possible because of the labor, forced labor of Africans that were brought in. Um, it's very rare. These are the slave cabins at Boone Hall Plantation, just also outside of Charleston. It's very rare to see slave cabins because they were built really cheaply out of wood. And, you know, once, you know, they were they were pretty badly built to begin with. And once slavery ended, um, they were abandoned and you know, left to just basically decay. Um, these were built out of brick. Um, these would have been really nice cabins, um, but you know, again, the people living here didn't have a choice. Uh, but it is at least an example that I can show you of the way uh, you know, people would have lived. Uh, they have very simple rooms uh, with a simple little bed frame. They didn't have a lot. You know, they were they were forced into their their lifestyle here, but um, you know, they made the best of it um, as as all people do when when their life isn't all that grand. And I'll leave you with uh, you know a slightly happier image. Uh, this is uh, the Avenue of the Oaks, the live oaks that are so famous in the American South, uh, also for Boone, Boone Hall Plantation outside of Charleston. So this was meant to just give you an overview of the type of architecture that we saw in the English colonies. You're going to be doing quite a bit more in your research.